Hi, everyone. I wanted to thank you for joining us for the Brain Initiative webinar series on technologies for recording and modulating neural activity. This is our fifth in the series. Uh, we have two presenters lined up for today, Lin Tian from UC Davis and Li Hong Wong from WashU in St. Louis. We also have two discussants, Vincent Pierrebone from Yale and Thomas Knopfel from Imperial College of London. The structure of the presentation today is there's going to be about a 20-minute presentation followed by a 10-minute discussion section whereby the, the two discussants will ask questions uh, to the presenters. Um, this, uh, as a reminder, is our last webinar for the summer. We're going to take the, the next month off, um, but uh, I plan to resume some more uh, webinars in the fall. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Lynn Tian for a presentation on illuminating the inner workings of the brain. All right. Um, can you all hear me? Okay. Um, yep. I'd like to thank... Yeah, okay. I'd like to thank the organizer for this great opportunity to present our work. Um, I, ha I have a problem to uh, go to my next slide. I have some technical issue. I can't can perceive the slides. Um, do you do you want to exit the presentation and then try again? Oh, here. Okay, I got it. Okay. I have. Okay. Yeah, got you. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. All right. I'd like to thank the organizer for this great opportunity to present our work. So at some point, I bet we are all fascinated by the skill and the diversity of the animal behavior. A spider spinning a web, a bear catching a ball, an eagle landing on a branch, or a person catching a ball or learn how to play a piano. However, I bet there's something we don't often think about at all. How do we do all those amazing things? Of course, the answer lies in our brains all these movements, actions, feelings, and sensations are mediated by performing hundreds of subconscious computations every second in our brains. Behavior is so diverse, adaptive, and effective, it is not surprising that the device controlling it, the brain, is incredibly complex. Even a little moth has 100 million brain cells and we have a hundred feelings. Those cells are interconnected by trillions of synapses to form a dynamic network that incorporates neural activity across brain structure. In the past 30 years, neuroscientists have done a lot to understand how the brain works. For example, we have a good understanding about the physiology and about chemistry of individual cells. We understand the end-channel function, program cell death, and transmitter release mechanism. However, it has been extremely hard to figure out the logic of neuron circuitry, the action of individual cells under the context of others, how those cells are wired together to make circuits that perform all the computation required for behavior, and how computation goes wrong in neurological disorders. Answering these questions will require precise measurement and perturbation of a specific neuron population and molecules in behaving animals who are specifically engaged in performing the computation or function of interest. To do so, we need a better technology that can increase our experimental capability. The Brain Initiative is accelerating the development of this technology for neuroscientists. Part of the reason it has been so difficult to um, for develop those uh, sensors is that you have to make them to use in animal where they're doing the behavior that you're trying to understand. It is one thing to take a nice 
picture of a dead brain tissue under a microscope. It is quite another to shoot live videos of electrical activity of hundreds of cells at a large scale while the animal is running down the maze to find a piece of food. However, we do need to accumulate those data sets, the large data set of millions of neurons starting together underlying a behavior, because this data set will help us to de develop and refine theories explaining the animal behavior in terms of brain physiology. And those, from there, we can develop new theories that can be used to treat neurological disorders. With the knowledge of protein structure and function, my lab build sensors that can transform your activity to light. So we can shoot a live video of hundreds of cells in action where animal behave. Application of these sensors to questions that are wide open in neuroscience can be potentially transformative. As an assistant professor, it has taken a very long time to get my lab going. So today, most of the data I will talk about is actually the ongoing activity that has not been published. So how we solve the problem of seeing neural activity? So neurons communicate heavily depend on the flux of small molecules, such as ions and neurotransmitters. For example, when action potential comes, it will activate the voltage-gated calcium channel that leads to a brief and rapid calcium influx into the cell body. Therefore, calcium has been always used as a proxy to measure neural activity. But the problem is how we can translate the calcium transient to the light. To do so, we design the genetically encoded sensor combining green fluorescent protein derived from jellyfish and the calcium binding protein derived from mammals. So as you can see here, the circular permuted GIP is sandwiched between the calcium binding proteins. When the calcium comes, it will bind to calcium sensing domain. This will lead to a conformational change. Such conformi conformational change will further modify the chrome 4 environment so the fluorescence can go from a dark protonated state to a bright deep protonated state. Because those sensors are genetically encodable, which means you can specifically target them to genetically define your own population or even subcellular compartment. This is a huge advantage compared to small molecule based probes. Combined with advanced optics, we can now transform the neural state to the changes of fluorescence intensity in real time. So this is actually a perfect way to understand the action of one cell under the context of the others, because you can see that from the, the calcium traces showed here, not only you can see the temporal activity of individual cells, but also you obtain the spatial relationship between those regional neuronal activity. The most significant feature of those genetically encoded sensors is that it will allow us to be able to repeatedly image the same field of the view over a long period of time. As the example showed here, that the same field of view can be viewed across about 50 days. This is extremely important because this time window will allow us to study how the behavior modulation can influence the neural activity. So we thus use this sensor to study the dynamic representation in the motor cortex during sensory motor learning. So as shown in this movie collected by my colleague Daniel Huber, you can see that you can image repeatedly um, to record the large populations in motor cortex, where the mice learn to detect objects with their whiskers 
and report the presence of the objects with flickering. From this experiment, we learned how the behavior to modulate neural activity, which is the motor cortex integrated sensor input to test the related motor program. Since then, GCAM has been uh, <coughs> has been developed and incrementally improved in terms of sensitivity, kinetics, and dynamic range. And imaging from soma from the population of neurons has led new discoveries in the field of system neuroscience. However, there's a problem. We know that the dynamic neural circuitry incorporates activity across brain structures. For that, neurons project long axons to communicate with neurons in a different brain region um, to relay the information. It is not clear how the signal carried by the distant axon can integrate with local circuitry. GCAM is engineered protein. And it's not a neuronal protein, so it doesn't equip with the mechanism that can be effectively transported to distant axon. With passive diffusion, we only can obtain about 20% proteins in axon that are made in soma, therefore reducing the signal-to-noise ratio during calcium imaging. So how we actually show here, so this is a, a axon imaging at the viral cortex in the projection uh, projected from thalamus. So you can see that, although we can see the GSP, Clearly, we can barely see the GCAM signaling uh, without injecting tons of slurs to potentially make the cell toxic in the thalamus. So to solve this problem, we employ genetic strategy for direct and active transportation of GCAM. So as you can see here, we test our probe in the social neuron as well as in vivo in visual cortex. You can see that now with uh, targeting, we can clearly see distant axons in the social neuron, as shown on the left. And the more strikingly, we can now see the distant axon labels and as many as bootons we can see. So this will significantly increase the signal to noise ratio during the axon imaging. Quantitatively, we can see that with targeting, we have about a five-fold increase of the axon to dendrite ratio, and functionally, we achieved about more than two point two and a half-fold increased uh, sensitivity compared to the probe that's not targeted. So. So far, I have told you that how awesome the calcium sensors are and what they are enable. However, uh, the neural activity is more than just a calcium signal. The neural communicator depends on the flux of a variety of signal molecules, such as neurotransmitter and neuromodulators. Through the experience building calcium sensors, we have learned a lot about the molecular basis of ligand sensing. And we also developed optimized pipelines for sensor engineering. So, so we feel that there's a need to develop a broader suite of optical sensors that actually can help address, uh, can measure optically all kinds of neural activity in the brain. One area that can be particularly addressed optically is neuromodulation. So in the nervous system, neuromodulation input can be acted at multiple points in your circuitry to control the output and the switch circuit dynamics and the behavior state. However, we don't quite know when and where and the neuromodulator are released and what is their concentration that's actually effective to modulate the neural circuitry. Existing tools for detecting neuromodulator, such as microdialysis and a cyclic voltammetry, 
are useful, but they're limited because it lack of cell type specificity and as well as molecular specificity. And they are not adequate to reveal spatial resolution to study signal events at individual synapse. So because we have experience building the calcium sensors, we think the same you know, theory can be applied to build a broad suite of tools. So we think one potential solution would be build a genetically encoded indicator based on the fluorescent protein that is to allow direct and specific measurement of those diverse type of neuromodulator, which can enhance the spatial and the temporal resolution. So how we do this? And this is also our free initiative project. So how do we do it? So again, we turn to the intensity-based sensor design. So why intensity-based sensors? So in general, the single FP sensor is more sensitive, photostable, and has broader dynamic range and faster kinetics compared to other sensors such as thread-based sensors. They're relatively small, therefore you can easily target to subcellular localizations such as axon termini. And also, they preserve spectral bandwidth, therefore can allow multiplex imaging or combine with other tools such as channel reduction. So previously, we have established an approach to generate a sensor to sensing glutamate. So as you see, you can see here, the CPJP again is inserted into a glutamate binding protein derived from E. coli. Binding glutamate will lead to the large conformational changes of this glutamate binding protein. Again, conformational change will modulate the crumble environment to translate glutamate to the light. So because of that, we think maybe a similar strategy can be employed to build the sensors for neuromodulators. So again, we're trying to look at bacteria PBB binding proteins because those proteins have a very large dynamic range upon ligand binding. However, there's a challenge. Although we think the PBB may be an attractive scaffold into which CPFC can be inserted to generate a useful sensor, the key challenge is that there is no naturally occurring PBBs described in the literature or even through homologous modeling to suggest that they have sufficient binding affinity to any of those neuromodulators. Why? The answer is obvious because those molecules are not environment abundant. You know, they are highly reactive chemicals, and if you have ever worked with those molecules, you will know, for example, dopamine can be oxidized within seconds on the bench top. So how do we do this? We turn it to computational modeling. So we think with computational modeling, we can re-engineer re the burning pocket of the existing PBB and to turn their specificity and affinity to any of those Belgian amines. So, so far, we have selected about five PBB scaffolds, and in total, 50,000 models have been generated for each amine. You know, the computation will only give you uh, a place to start. For example, uh, this red line shows the performance of the computation design variant. And to further increase the dynamic range and affinity, we have to use combined library screening, the direct evolution method. So as you can see that we can eat, we can use computational uh, generate structures to simulate the single set that can maybe help the uh, binding. And then from there, we will generate the position and use linear regression to predict the best residues in each position. 
and through a cumulative improvement, we can finally improve the performance of the sensor and affinity a lot, about five to six folds. So this effort now results a, a very good sensor, serotonin, for example, serotonin sensor that has about 4.5 fold dynamic range. So the iGlusniffer's dynamic range is about five fold. So it's actually on par with iGlusniffer. Although the affinity for serotonin is still at a lower range, which is falling between 75 to 150 micromolar. But as you can see that the purple line represents the sensor we originally um, in, uh, designed from computational modeling. Now with direct evolution and the combined computational modeling, we actually can significantly improve the sensitivity of the sensor. As a panel of effort, we also build the sensors for non a very important neuromodulator mediating stress response. So as you can see that the, the affinity of this sensor is actually within nanomolar uh, range. However, the dynamic range is still very limited compared to serotonin sensor. And then, so this is a titration curve. Actually, we just performed the, on the distortion neuronal culture. And you can see the sensor perform very robustly, although uh, the dynamic range can be further improved. So as I said, this is ongoing activity, and uh, we are still working on trying to make the sensor sensitive enough to be used in uh, behaving animals. All those efforts are not possible without a pipeline of high throughput engineering. So, for example, with swimming service computation, we'll generate thousands of variants in E. coli protein. And we will test them, the affinity and the dynamic range in the cell life And those information will provide feedback for further computational modeling. Uh, a few variants will actually move on into our pipeline through the social neuronal culture to test their sensitivity in situ. And finally, a uh, handful of sensors will be tested in acute slides uh, to reveal their sensitivity in response to your, uh, action potential stimulate neuromodulator release. And at the same time, uh, the sensors will be further validated in vivo to see whether they, are, they can meet the requirement of highly uh, required signal to noise ratio in the behaving animals. So currently, my lab is actually testing the sensors in the uh, living mice models and also uh, starting some uh, zebrafish work as a collaboration with uh, Woody Asakov at um, UC Berkeley. So we're hoping, you know, we can generate the sensors, eventually it can be validated um, in a, a broad diversity of animal models and can be disseminated to the community as a general to apply to questions that are right open in neuroscience. So in summary, you know, I have told you about our journey for sensor engineering. As you can see that, if we're looking back, the first, although the first genetic calcium indicator been developed back in 1997, it's really the development of this GCAM3 because it increased the performance that can meet the challenging signal-to-noise ratio in living animals, really make a difference in the system of neuroscience. And in the past seven years, um, a lot of sensors have been engineered especially the sensors probing voltage. So we think this is really a, a golden time for us to build the tools to decipher the neural circuitry, and also thanks to the Bird Initiative. Now we're looking forward, and I'm really hoping that where we build the sensors, we can also expand the spectral, the current spectrum to allow multiplex imaging and also deeper imaging. So with the protein, that's derived from a new organism that have actually a near infrared range. We are hoping we can also build sensors, you know, that can be applied for other imaging modality uh, to achieve a 3D map of a neural circuitry.
So with that, I would like to thank my lab, so those people who actually done the work, and especially Joey, Tommaso, and Lucia on the list, who actually the person did the work uh, I present in this talk. And I really thank all those young scientists who are willing to invest their career with me uh, at the system professor stage. And also this work is not possible there to get uh, from getting input from my colleague at UC Davis, such as Vladimir, John Zach, Kate Lam, and Clark Lagaris. I know this work are not impossible without generous support from John, uh, Johnny Malvin and Laura Luger at H.H. My um, Divinia Farm. And finally, I thank my collaborator, Leopoldo, Na, and Udi for validate our sensors in behaving animals at early developmental stage. And finally, I have to thank to all the funding sources to make my lab going, uh, to make us possible to uh, do all those amazing signs, and especially the free initiative. And with that, I would like to stop here and uh, um, accept any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our two discussions for today are Thomas Knopfel and Vincent Pierrebone. We'll go ahead and turn it over to Thomas first for questions. Yes, uh, Lynn. Uh, hi. Uh, good to see. Good to see you again. Uh, I don't know if you remember our conversations yeah. three years ago. So I have two uh, relatively short questions because I think we don't have too much time. The first thing is, and that's probably just a short answer. Now doing doing all this protein engineering, you also need to use instruments to, to finally record from, from the animals which you are generating. So you're not an expert on the instrument, but instruments, but you're a user. What would you think, which are the future microscopes needed to take full advantage of those uh, amazing probes you are developing? I mean, of course, the faster the better. So I know, you know there's a, a, a lot of labs build the instrument and to, especially for fluorescent imaging and to increase the speed of, uh, like for example, two photon imaging. And at the same time, you know, there's other imaging modalities. For example, you know, our next speaker is uh, Lei Hong and who's building this amazing photoacoustic imaging modality to allow 3D imaging and also the deep brain imaging. Uh, you know, the speed is, it's definitely a problem, but I think the more I think about it, I think also, you know, we, we just have to keep developing the probes and not just for fluorescent imaging, but also for other imaging modalities. So we can not just see the structure of the neural circuitry, um, but the more we want to uh, obtain the functional information and to, you know, understand how the brain works, to understand the brain mechanism, control the behavior. Yeah. Uh, just to follow up, what about the field of view? How, uh, I mean, you were mentioning about the axons and uh, about the long range interactions. So field of view might be a limitation which we have nowadays with a classical two-photon microscopy. Oh, I think that that potential can be a problem. But the thing is, the the problem for now is, you know, if you don't have those specific targeted sensors. You don't even you don't you don't even see those labeled structures. So the field of uh, will be will be a problem. But I think it, you know people now actually building the even the wide field microscope that's so fast and it can can be utilized to uh, imaging the you know a broader broader field. Mm, okay, thank you. Uh, perhaps I give it to Vincent. All right, thank you. Hey, how you doing, Lynn? Um, hey. You chose this uh, this binding domain uh, as opposed to the ones that are in uh, sort of glue sniffer. Can you just describe the, the process of thinking about doing that? Uh, can, can you repeat your question again? So, can you could you just describe a little bit of the reasoning about how you picked uh, this binding? Uh, protein. In other words, how do you find it, and how did you choose it as the as the template with which to use to try to develop these these uh, probes? Right. So you know, there's a lot of uh, PBB you can choose from, right? Um, but 
our criteria is, you know, for example, um, when we, if we want to make GABA sensor, we probably can go with natural GABA binding protein. But with those neuromodulations, so there's no naturally occurring PBB. So we basically just do uh, homology modeling to see whether the side of the binding pocket at first actually can accommodate the side of those neuromodulators. So, so that's uh, actually one good criteria. And the other thing is we're trying to select the PBB that actually have existing crystal structure. So this will allow us, you know, as a template for uh, computational design. And then the point at which you put the fluorescent protein in, the point of sort of permutation of the molecule, uh, mm -hmm. that's empirically determined? Yeah, so that's actually a choline binding uh, PBB. And so where you place the GFP in that sequence is selected yeah. by? So, so that's actually, so that's, you know, that the CPJ be happy placed properly into, you know, those uh, PBB. So, so based on structure, we kind of uh, um, align the sequence with eye sniffer, and then we can see, you know, where there's some, maybe the loop region that's actually close to the chromophore uh, that actually can be influenced by those large conformational changes. So we, we have to try different positions for insertion, and we have to, you know, when in sensor engineer, we all know the linker matters. So we have to do the large scale screening of the linker and to determine the sequence that actually can prefer those, um, you know, can sense this large conformation and translate to the chromophore. So it's, it's not an easy task. I imagine. So you go through thousands. It looks like from the graph, thousands and thousands of uh, of screens prior to finding improved. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So I said, you know, we we, we generate like fifty thousand models just for, for each molecule, and we we then have to selectively synthesize those molecules just to do a initial test, and then from there we have to build the library, you know, for. To, to screen and improve the affinity and dynamic range. So, so, so I think because, you know, the, the experience we had uh, making other sensors and also, you know, those large platforms we developed in the lab, we would kind of have a handle to be able to handle all those large scale screens. Um, you know, those postdocs and see that they are just amazing. And I didn't do any of this work, so they are just so amazing <laughs> to be able to handle this daily, you know, experimental um, challenge. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Matthew, do you want to open this up to other people to ask? or? Uh, no, I think we're going to go ahead and move on to our next presentation at this point. So. Um, at, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Li Hong Wang uh, for his presentation on photoacoustic tomography for depth and compressed ultra-fast photography for speed. Okay, do I have to request again to... Uh, we're working on transferring that right now. Okay. All right. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. All right. I can request again. Um, nope. So if you go to the, oh, there we go. All right. You can Good. see it. Yes. Thank you, All right. So you see the movies as well. We do. Yes. All right. All right. Um, let me start by thanking the nice team for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'll be covering two topics, one, one for depth, one for speed. Uh, starting from the motivation and challenges in our field in general, I'll be covering photoacoustic tomography and compressed ultra-fast photography. Light has a very unique role to play in biomedicine. Uh, from a very fundamental level, light-matter interaction occurs at the molecular level. Um, this, this is very unique. I'm showing the EM spectrum, which is on log scale. Light occupies a very small region of the entire EM spectrum. But this is, this is the only region that gives you molecular information directly. 
By uh, given the important role of molecules in medicine biology, uh, we can really not we we cannot afford to ignore light uh, for uh, medical applications. By detecting molecules, we can provide in vivo functional imaging analogous to MRI, uh, in vivo metabolic imaging analogous to PET, in vivo molecular imaging of gene expressions or disease markers, even in vivo label-free histological imaging, which is very much analogous to H staining. So we, we can accomplish a, a, a whole list of functions. However, however we face a lot of challenges because of light scattering. The mean free path between scattering events in tissue is on the order of 100 microns. 350 years ago, conventional microscopy was invented. It allows us to image maybe through about 10 microns or so of tissue uh, before the wavefront gets distorted. So the conventional microscopy uses on average the wavefront to form an image. They cannot penetrate beyond about 100 microns, which is the aberration limit. Tomographic microscopy, such as confocal or two-photon or OCT, allows us to go beyond 100 microns, so we've conquered the aberration limit, and we can reach multiple hundreds of microns up to about a millimeter in penetration depth, because this, this approach um, rejects the multiple scatter light from the signals and retains the single or on scatter light uh, to, to uh, achieve high resolution. But the tomographic approach uh, is limited uh, to about a millimeter in penetration, which is the so-called optical diffusion limit. Using photoacoustic microscopy or photoacoustic tomography in general, we uh, conquered the optical diffusion limit. We've uh, advanced the penetration by nearly two orders of magnitude. Now we're talking about up to seven or even eight centimeters penetration. The reason that we can penetrate so deep is primarily because we use diffuse light. And you can see the photon path, the representative photon path here. We allow photons to scatter around and still provide useful signals for us. I'll explain how we can um, achieve uh, high resolution by detecting the photoacoustic signals. Just like anything else, we face the next challenge, which is the dissipation limit. There is a very active field I don't have time to talk about, which is wavefront engineering or wavefront shaping, especially the version that uses internal guide stars. The goal is actually by shaping the wavefront, we penetrate beyond the optical dissipation limit, go uh, reach tens of multiple tens of centimeters. So today I'll focus on photoacoustic tomography, which will be plenty useful for brain imaging, especially in small animals where we can image the whole uh, animal brain. Let me start with photoacoustic CT. We broaden the laser, broaden the laser beam, and we typically use nanosecond laser pulses because we want to make sure we're within the safety limit set by ANSI. Again, we allow photons to scatter, but when scattered photons are absorbed, it generates heating, a, a very short transient in heating. Every milli-degrees will be converted into 800 pascals of pressure, which is detectable already. So you can imagine if you heat up uh, the tissue to hundreds of milli-degrees, then you have a very good SNR to work with. We deploy a number of ultrasound transducers for ultrasonic detection. Notice, notice the difference here between acoustic scattering and uh, optical scattering, and the scattering coefficients differ by orders of magnitude. The mean free path between acoustic scattering events is on the order of one, uh, on the order of one meter at an uh, ultrasound frequency we typically use. So biological tissue to ultrasound is water to light. Ultrasound can see through tissue really, really well, except when you use pure ultrasound imaging, you don't see molecules. Using optical absorption combined with ultrasonic detection, we combine the strengths of both modalities, namely optical contrast with ultrasonic resolution at great depth. We do have to use inverse spherical readon transform to form an image, which is somewhat analogous to X-ray uh, linear readon transform, except that we deal with a higher dimension. This slide shows the first set of functional photoacoustic images, also the first set of in vivo photoacoustic images. Um, by wiggling one side of the whiskers of a small animal, we can see the contralateral side of the brain activate hemodynamically. So non-invasively, we can detect the blood signal and see the changes, uh, somewhat similar to both MRI. Since the publication of this paper in 2003, we can see uh, the growth of our field. And part in a number of papers uh, in, the, in the photoacoustics area, um, you can see roughly every three years, the field doubled in size. 
Since 2010, the conference on photoacoustics uh, became the largest at Photonics West, which has roughly 20,000 attendees every year. So why is photoacoustics so exciting? This might be the only omniscale imaging modality that allows us to provide contrast in vivo uh, in a consistent way because we image optical absorption. This is a very key uh, piece of information here. Unlike fluorescence imaging, here we depend on light absorption. Uh, all molecules absorb at some wavelength. If you uh, tune your laser wavelengths to the absorption band, you will detect the molecules. This is an extremely powerful feature because if you depend on fluorescence, you have to, you're essentially at the mercy of the fluorescence quantum yield. Uh, there are far more molecules that are non-fluorescent than there are that are fluorescent. And plotting the imaging depth versus the spatial resolution here, uh, you can see by implementing our photoacoustic technology in different uh, embodiments, we can see, uh, we can tune the imaging depth and associated spatial resolution. This dashed line connects all different versions of our technologies. And we can image from organelles, even proteins, through cells, tissues, all the way to organs. The standard practice right now in medicine and biology is for cells and below, we prefer to use optics. For tissues and above, we switch to non-optics because there's no high-resolution optical modality that allows you to image that deep. There's a huge divide here between the cell and tissue levels. Photoacoustics uh, bridges this gap and provides a continuum for imaging from a protein solution to organs. This can be very important for omniscale biological research from organelles to uh, even small animal organisms. Um, translation of microscopic lab discoveries to microscopic clinical practice. I'll cover a few of the versions of our technologies today very briefly. With the resources we have, we've finished building uh, what I call a dream machine for uh, single shot imaging. This is extremely fast. We're talking about speed and field of view. And this is multi-scale, so you can scale your field of view, and, but the speed uh, is a, as fast as within 100 microseconds. I'll explain why. So this version, this system is very versatile. We can provide trunk imaging of a small animal or brain imaging. For trunk imaging, we start from the laser. You pick the right wavelength to use. We use a conical lens to convert a beam into a hollow beam, um, illuminate the animal, generate photoacoustic signals. We use a full ring ultrasonic transducer. So this is why, this is why we call this panoramic. With a full ring, we, have, uh, we minimize artifacts, provide the best image quality. Then we use a one-to-one -one data acquisition. So with a single laser shot, we can generate, generate the image. This is why we call this single impulse. This is a close-up of the key components. We have a hollow beam for illumination. Then we have ultrasonic focus for sectioning. Then we have 512 elements of ultrasonic transducers for concurrent imaging, and that gives you a reconstructed image for resolution in the X, Y, or uh, lateral directions. For brain imaging, we use a diffuser that generates a solid cone beam to illuminate the brain. Again, with a single laser shot, under 100 microseconds, all your data is acquired. So there's zero motion artifact. Then you can repeat your laser pulse for the next image. One of the versions is to uh, fire the laser at 50 hertz. So we can generate 50 hertz to the imaging. Uh, the frame rate becomes 50 hertz. And this is the image of the trunk region. Um, we can see uh, various features of the organs, the liver, of, uh, both lobes, portal vein, um, and so on and so forth. And this is all endogenous contrast. So the pharmas are very interested in this type of te technologies. Without using any ionizing radiation, we use intrinsic information not to see just the structure, but also the function, because we can use multiple wavelengths to provide hemodynamic information. You can detect water lipids and whatever absorbs light. And you can also introduce proteins and other contrast agents. This is a brain image. We're looking at uh, the rat. We can see uh, through the whole brain without any problem. You can, you can see this is an 11 millimeter deep uh, rat brain. We can see uh, some of the detailed uh, blood vessel structures. This is a mouse brain, smaller, so we have to use a different system to uh, increase the ultrasound frequency. You can see some of the details here, diving vessels, uh, some of the detailed structures here deep in the brain. So all of this is endogenous contrast. Later on, I'll show you some of the exogenous contrast effort. This can be applied for all sorts of applications, resting, resting state, connectivity. So we're looking at hemodynamic contrast again here. You can see both sides of the brain are connected. 
sort of like uh, you know, MRI-based type of imaging, um, except that we use endogenous hemoglobin contrast. By the way, both MRI, uh, both based MRI is sensitive primarily to deoxyhemoglobin. Photoacoustics is sensitive to both oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. We scaled up the system for large organ, uh, human organ imaging. So this is a uh, system for human breast imaging. Uh, you can see there's a big range to accommodate um, most of the breasts. And we have a bigger range um, uh, for a concurrent photoacoustic detection as well. With a single laser shot, you get an image of a cross-section of the breast. And you can see here, this, is, this cross-section is the farthest from the chest wall, three centimeters away from the chest wall. You can see signals from the nipple and along some blood vessels. And then we approach the, the chest wall here. This is at uh, the chest wall at zero centimeters. And you will see uh, different layers of the breast with different structures of blood vessels. The next natural step is to take this to image breast tumor. For a photoacoustic microscopy, we're aiming at uh, even higher absolute resolutions by giving up uh, the penetration depth. So this photograph shows the first 3D photoacoustic microscope. Um, this close-up shows some of the details. So the key concept is to generate a hollow cone beam, and the cone beam is refocused into the tissue. On the tissue surface, we have a donut-shaped illumination. The core of the beam is dark to minimize the surface interference. The ultrasound detection is confocal with light illumination to maximize the signal-to-noise ratio. With a single laser shot, you generate a 1D depth resolved image. Then this head is raster scanned in this water tray to form a 3D image. There's a little membrane window right here that allows us to couple light and sound. The tissue is placed below the membrane window. And so you can penetrate uh, uh, from multiple millimeters to within a millimeter. I'm showing you some of the images primarily acquired within about a millimeter that gives you the highest possible spatial resolution. So um, you can see uh, we, uh, we push the imaging speed using this approach because you use single, uh, single ultrasound transducer, so you have to repeat your laser pulse at a very high rate. And this was based on um, uh, 500 kilohertz. So every second, we acquire 500,000 1D images. And you can distribute that for 3D imaging. Within one second, we acquire an image of the entire uh, brain surface. And this is fast enough for functional imaging. We use a uh, high stimulation. We can see one side of the brain activate, and later on you'll see the other side of the brain activate as well. We want to push oximetry, oxygen imaging, to the ultimate level, single red blood cell level. So this is the system being demonstrated at 1 hertz, 20 hertz. The actual rate is 200 hertz. So at this rate, we can see 3D images at a 20 hertz uh, imaging rate. And uh, the resolution and the speed is high enough that we can see single red blood cells and watch how they bifurcate. We can even uh, fire two laser pulses of two different wavelengths so we can uh, image the oxygen saturation of every single red blood cell and watch how oxygen is released in real time. And you can see a bunch of red blood cells moving in our human uh, finger cuticle. There's one right here that releases oxygen. You can watch how the color changes as oxygen is released. So hopefully this type of uh, capability can provide neuro, uh, studies of neurovascular coupling at the most fundamental level. We can push this for um, uh, CTC, circulating tumor cell imaging. And here what we're showing is uh, before we inject any CTCs, there's no ADC in the bloodstream. After injection, we can see single CTCs. And what we do is that we use hardware to trigger immediately um, um, a much stronger laser to zap the CDCs, and that will allow, allow us to uncage um, the antigens. So the goal is to, to first remove the primary melanoma. This is a melanoma-based CDC, and we clear circulating tumor cells, and we can uncage antigens alive, and the hope is to elicit immuno response and to destroy uh, any, any of the remaining metastases. So um, this is a more cancer-related project we can probably think of ways to use this for brain research as well. Photoacoustics can also provide super resolution imaging by beating uh, the optical diffraction limit using nonlinearity. And so this is the linear version of the photoacoustic microscope that gives you 230 micron uh, nanometer resolution. Uh, the nanoscopic version gives you 90 nanometer resolution. You can see this is uh, mitochondrion. Uh, here's a toggle between the two. We can see even some of the structures within the mitochondrion. 
And here's the EM, EM uh, micrograph for comparison. So the next goal is to image all sorts of uh, um, other contrast mechanisms, especially uh, proteins relevant to brain imaging. And here, this is a demonstration of glucose metabolism. So this might be useful down the road as well. Using endogenous contrast, we can see oxygen uh, stimulation or uh, oxygen response. Um, then here, we can look at um, uh, glucose metabolism, very much like PET imaging. So this might be relevant for brain research as well. This is a very recent uh, work, and uh, we use a switchable protein um, to detect the signal. And you can see, um, because of the blood background in this case, and when the proteins are switched on and off, you have a big background that overwhelms the signal. So the on and off images are not that different. Um, but when we subtract them, we uh, show up the signal, su suppress the background. This is the overlay. So this is directly relevant to brain research because later on we're going to look at some other of the, the action potentials of related signals using proteins. Uh, this slide shows probably the first unequivocal demonstration that photoacoustics is sensitive to G-CAM signals. Even though it's built as a fluorescence um, indicator, it, it's also a very good uh, photoacoustic indicator. So we switch to uh, fruit fly because there's no hemoglobin as a background. Because sometimes the, the response time between uh, uh, calcium and uh, um, hemoglobin responses are very similar, so it's very hard to temporally differentiate them. And so here, in order to demonstrate this clearly, we just avoid hemoglobin to begin with. You can see with uh, the older on, you can see the response from both photoacoustics and uh, fluorescence, which uh, proves our signal. And this is a uh, 3D image version. We can see the uh, brain of this fruit fly. And upon older activation, you can see a spike. That's like 50% spike um, from uh, given regions. There are some interesting layer structures in this uh, fruit fly brain that shows up very nicely using photoacoustic microscopy. So in the remaining uh, minutes, I'll uh, talk very briefly about compressed ultrafast photography. Um, in the past 20 years, our lab has focused on pushing the penetration, trying to image deeper uh, with higher resolution. But we also have a great need for faster cameras because the standard camera speed is simply not enough for a lot of the imaging uh, requirements or needs. So we built the first, uh, we built the fastest uh, camera in the world that requires receive-only detection so we don't have to synchronize to multiple shots. This is single shot imaging. You acquire your uh, you run your event only twice, only once. So um, if you have a non-repetitive event, you don't have to repeat it. You, have, you don't have to worry about that. So this camera allows us to acquire 100 billion frames per second. Uh, this frame rate is high enough for us to see a light pulse. And you're literally watching a light pulse, and that was acquired in re real time. Of course, to playback for us to see, we have to slow down the camera by 10 billion times. Uh, you can see this light pulse uh, propagating in air gets reflected, refracted, and two light pulses are competing, having a race right here. And this uh, movie shows the fastest fluorescence lifetime imaging. This is a single shot fluorescence lifetime imaging. We fire a um, excitation light pulse, and you, this ca camera was also dual colored. So we have two colored, one, one was to image the excitation. And you just saw this uh, a green fluorescence excitation pulse, and the red is the fluorescence emission. So this can be directly useful for biological applications. And this is another demonstration. We have this supersonic mock cone. When you have a source, a sound source that propagates uh, faster than the speed of sound, you will see this cone structure. And this is the you know mechanical version, acoustic version. We also have the optical counterpart. So now we can see this in real time. You see this, this is an optical um, mock cone. Uh, so you, you have a super, super luminous source running a material that generates this cone phenomenon. I'm not so sure how much time we have to talk about the detail. I'll probably skip, uh, well, run this really quickly so you know, have a rough idea how this works. We start from the object. Uh, that can be modeled uh, as intensity I versus X, Y, and time T. We map uh, that uh, scene, it's a dynamic scene onto this D and D, but we have a pseudo-random pattern, binary pattern, uh, described by C of X, Y to modulate uh, the scene. So the encoded scene is routed toward this street camera. 
Unlike commi uh, the conventional use of a street camera, we open the entrance slit as widely as possible to provide simultaneous vertical resolution and time resolution. Because standard street camera will only give you resolution of X and T. We want to have resolution of X, Y, and time T. Then you go through this uh, um, shearing process in the street camera that converts basically time into vertical position. And then the CCD camera will integrate everything. And in the end, we have this um, energy matrix. So the CCD, matrix, CCD camera will detect uh, energy E versus XY. It's connected to uh, the original intensity I through the three operators, T, S, and C, as we just described. So by solving this equation, we, uh, we end up with a movie. So this is easier said than done, of course, because if you look at this equation, on the left side, you have two dimensions, x and y. And on the right-hand side, you have three dimensions, x, y, and time, t. In the most general case, this equation may not be solvable. So we have to resort to compressed sensing. Uh, thanks to the breakthrough in the compressed sensing field, we are now able to solve this equation. What is the immediate application we can think of? Uh, we're very excited about the possibility of imaging in real time. Um, the traffic in a you know, neural network. And so this is an example. On the left side, we have the standard fastest commercial camera that gives you two kilohertz. On the right-hand side, we're setting the camera speed to one megahertz. You can see this action potential propagation. Um, you see one branch is terminated, and the other branch will be activated. The synapse was activated. If we focus on this branch, it will continue propagation. Action potential was transmitted. It will continue propagation. It's especially this branch, this is a myelinated axon branch, so the signal propagates really fast. None of the standard cameras will be fast enough to capture this propagation. So on the left side, there are only three frames uh, because the speed is simply not enough. You don't really know how the traffic flowed. But on the right-hand side, you can see the great detail. Even though we have to slow down our camera uh, from billions of frames to, uh, to millions of frames. So this is a computer simulation, and we need to do this experimentally to finally prove the concept. Photoacoustic mic microscopes have been commercialized by uh, Microphotoacoustics. I do have to disclose my financial interest in this company. And we've been funded by NIH primarily and March of Dimes. Credit goes to my lab members for details. There are YouTube videos on photoacoustics, and we have our website and a couple of books. I will give you details as well. And we're relocating to Caltech, so we're looking for uh, talented postdocs, students, and even technicians. Thank you very much. Thanks, Li Hong. Uh, and at this point, we'll go ahead and first turn it over to Vincent to start the round of discussion. Beautiful. That's uh, beautiful, Li Hong. Um, Thank you. Can I ask you a bit about uh, noise? In other words, um, would would you explain? Do, do these need to be done in a particularly quiet environment? In other words, what, what, is the, what are the future possibilities of sort of head mounting something like this in a, in a complex environment? Is, is there a problem with that? Um, it's, um, you know, ultimately you, you have to worry about the photon shot noise, right? Nobody can really bypass that. Um, there, there are ways, like quantum ways, to overcome that, but right now the effect is very limited. So, so to a large degree, it doesn't matter what kind of detectors you use, you face the same issue. And head mount um, is, is, uh, would be a natural step uh, for live animal imaging. You're talking about the ultra-fast camera, I presume, right? Well, the photo so, of uh, G-cam imaging, that kind of thing. Uh, the, uh, you're talking about the photoacoustics approach? Yeah. Photo, yeah, so um, the photoacoustics approach, we are actually working on that. Um, so that's a... You know, we have to make sure the device is uh, miniaturized and make sure it's low weight and hold it mounted safely. Uh, so it's um, an it's, uh, ongoing direction. Uh, we may not even be the only one working on that. Um, so technically, there's, uh, there's no problem. Um, you know, we, we built endoscopes that are even smaller uh, than, uh, than the head mount devices. And so we built uh, endoscopes small enough to use in humans to image the GI tract. You know, we're building uh, several versions for cervical imaging for preterm birth uh, estimation. So, so the, some, of the, some of those technologies can be transferred. So acoustic noise in the environment doesn't affect the measurement because it's evoked? 
Right, acoustic noise we don't have to worry about at all because uh, first of all the bands are very different. The bandwidth uh, we detect megahertz bandwidth, and the uh, standard ambient acoustic noise is very low frequency. And also we are highly synchronized because we fire our laser shot, and that's uh, you, we detected over a very short time period. You know, so because we, within like say 100 microseconds, your, all, all of your signals are received already. So. So it's sort of uh, windowed. So if you were to think about uh, sort of protein probes, in other words, that could be trans that could be expressed inside cells. I guess absorb changes in absorptive features are obviously what you need, as opposed to changes in quantum yield. Is there any other aspect that you that? We well, so both both are welcome. So in fact. Um, um, for fluorescence, you detect a signal that's proportional to the fluorescence quantum yield. Um, to the first order, we detect a signal that's proportional to one minus the fluorescence quantum yield. So when you have when you have a fluorescence quantum yield change, we will see a change as well. Okay. And this is why we simply try a GCAM, but you you will see a signal here as well. Hmm. Right. Very nice. Thank oh. you. Is Thomas still with us? Yes, I'm. I'm. I'm here. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, hi, Leong. Uh, so that's uh, exceedingly uh, amazing, <laughs> and uh, and you have proven so many principles. Uh, so it might be very difficult to find another principle. But just recently in our uh, lab meeting, uh, uh, one of the students were mentioning why one wouldn't combine two photon microscopy. If uh, photoacoustic uh, tomography, because uh, when when people use two photon microscopy, they shoot in a lot of uh, laser power, uh, pulse uh, pulse light, and uh, and they boil the brain often, and so so that should be good to detect uh, sound waves. What do you right, think about right. that? It, it's possible. In fact, uh, several labs have explored that direction um, already. So. In fact, uh, there are different ways of combining. I mean, you can do a multimodality combination, which uh, we've done. We build a trimodality system. Uh, the original motivation was uh, to leverage uh, the popularity of two photon imaging in neuroscience, um, and we added a new contrast to it. So what we did was uh, we bought a commercial uh, two photon slash confocal system from Olympus. Then we added uh, photoacoustic microscopy to it. And so uh, the other way of com combining two photons is simply use two photon absorption to generate acoustic signals. Yeah, that's a possibility as well. Yeah, yeah. very yeah. interesting yeah. again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Great. Right. In the presentation, you used a nanosecond laser. Is that correct? It was not right. We typically use nanosecond. Sometimes, uh, for one of them, actually, the 500 kilohertz scanning ray uh, or, or laser ray, ray, we used a uh, picosecond laser. And so most of the time we don't use femtosecond for excitation because uh, you know, nanosecond gives you a wide enough acoustic bandwidth for us to acquire nice images already. So when you go to a super short um, pulse width, you're working at a different regime, and the tissue damage mechanism is, is also different. Because with nanosecond, uh, the damage mechanism is thermal, and our photoacoustic uh, origin is also thermal. This is very nice because we don't need a super high temperature, so that means if we get adequate signal, uh, we can actually use our signal to monitor. We don't generate damage in tissue. We're monitoring the signal simultaneously, the potential for damage. Or when you get, get to a femtosecond, then you have to worry about optical breakdown. So that's a different mechanism for tissue damage. Yeah. yeah. There's one more possibility that I didn't have time to mention. Uh, that single shot uh, photoacoustic CT and that, that basically gives you a 2D image with a single laser shot. Now, in the ideal world, nobody can afford this yet. If we have not just a, a 1D ring of ultrasound transducers, we have a, a surface, maybe a hemispherical surface covered with ultrasound transducers. With a single laser, sh laser shot, we can potentially get a 3D image. And there's some uh, work in that direction, but usually the transducers are too sparse to get a uh, high-resolution image. Uh, but but the ideal world, ideal world would be um, essentially acoustic wavelength over two spaces in between elements, and that would give us really high resolution images. 
it's, even though I said that's the ideal world, actually the ultrasound um, community is working in that direction. It'll take some time to mature, though. Can we ask questions? Yeah. Hello? Um, hello. No, uh, I think uh, at this point we'll probably go ahead and need to, to wrap up the discussion. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to, to let us know, and we can definitely pass them along to the presenters. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and thank both Lynn and Lee Hong for their presentations, as well as Vincent Thomas for participating in the discussion. Uh, and I'd like to remind you again that we're not going to have any webinars in August, so look forward to invitations for future webinars starting in September. Uh, thank you, and have a good weekend. Thank you all. Thank you, gentlemen. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.